My name is Edward DC. I'm a motivational psychologist. And for the last 40 years or so, Richard Ryan and I have worked together to develop, test, refine, elaborate a theory of motivation, development, and wellness that we call self-determination theory. It is not only the two of us who've been working on it, of course. There are literally hundreds of psychologists from around the world who've participated in the process. Self-determination theory begins by making an important um, distinction. Most people who think about psychology think about it as a unitary concept. Namely, it's something that differs just in amount. How can I get someone more motivated to do something? How can I get that person less motivated to do something? They really, the focus is always on amount. But from the beginning, Ryan and I have believed that it was important to think about types of motivation rather than the amount of motivation. Our primary distinction is between what we call autonomous motivation and controlled motivation. Autonomous motivation describes or names what you're doing when you're feeling a full sense of willingness, volition, and choice. Whatever the activity is, if you're doing it with a real sense of interest, enjoyment, and value, then it's likely that you're autonomously motivated. In contrast is controlled motivation. Controlled motivation refers to doing something in order to get some reward or to avoid some punishment. It means doing something because you're feeling pressured, demanded, obliged to be doing it. I think when most people think about motivation, they're more often thinking about controlled motivation than autonomous motivation. But we have found that <clears throat> when people are more autonomously motivated, the performance, their wellness, their engagement, all of those things are greater when you're autonomously motivated than when you're controlled in your motivation. So that's the, the first important distinction that we make in self-determination theory. The second important point is we believe that all human beings have a set of basic psychological needs. The needs that we believe are important are the need for competence, that is to say, to feel confident and effective in relation to whatever it is you're doing. Second, to feel relatedness, that is to say, to feel cared for by others, to care for others, to feel like you belong in various groups that are important to you. And the third need is autonomy. I've already said a bit about autonomy. But now I'm making the point that autonomy is actually a human need. And a human need is something that people must get satisfied for optimal wellness and optimal performance. If they don't get it, the need satisfied, then there will be negative psychological consequences that follow. The concept of psychological needs um, being universal is an important one because it's what lets us know and understand what it is that will promote autonomous motivation. When people feel competent, when they feel related to others, and when they're feeling a sense of volition, they will be autonomously motivated and the positive consequences will follow from that. So the importance of this is that when you ask questions like how do you promote effective motivation in the workplace or in schools 
or in healthcare clinics, wherever it is, whatever domain of life you're talking about, if you are interested in producing optimal outcomes, the way in which you can do that as a parent or a teacher or an employer, the way that you can do that is create the circumstances so that people who are learning or playing or um, performing for you so that they will be optimal in their outcomes what you need to be doing is supporting their basic psychological needs. Now when it comes to autonomous motivation there are actually two types of autonomous motivation. When I first started doing this work I was very interested in the concept of intrinsic motivation. To do something because you're intrinsically motivated means you do it because you find it interesting and enjoyable. That contrasts with extrinsic motivation, which means you do it because it leads to some separable consequence. Okay, so intrinsic motivation is one type of autonomous motivation. The other type of autonomous motivation was really developed by Richard Ryan. It was he who got interested in the idea of extrinsic motivation and whether extrinsic motivation could be autonomous or not. And what he found um, in research and in other research that we did together is that people can actually internalize extrinsic motivation in such a way as they own it as their own. And when they do that, when they understand the value of the activity that may be rewarded or requested of them, when they do that and identify with the value of it and integrate it so that it's a part of themselves, they will be autonomously motivated and the outcomes that you observe in such situations will be very positive.